Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Learning Lunch hosted by Format Approved. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch title is Patient Data Archiving. We're joined today by Rick Adams. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rick. You're welcome. Rick has extensive expertise in data archiving and integration, extraction, migration, conversion. You can see all the different uh, ways he can manipulate data there on your screen. He has a long experience in health IT, and so you couldn't ask for a better expert to discuss the ins and outs of data archiving. We are very happy to have him with us today. Oops. All right, so before we move on into our actual presentation, I'd like to just give you a chance to look at the questions while I go over some quick housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have questions for our expert today, feel free to enter those into the chat area at any time. We will save those questions until the end of our presentation and we'll allow our expert to answer as many as time allows. If we do run out of time, our expert will be happy to provide written answers to those questions and get them to you after the presentation. Also, people always ask us if they can get slides and a recording of the event in case they want to share it with other folks. Rest assured that all registrants for today's event after the uh, event is concluded will receive an email with a copy, a PDF copy of the slides and then a link to the recording along with other materials. So don't worry about getting your hands on those slides. All right, well, thank you again for joining us today, Rick. Just in case there's people out there who may not be familiar with even you know, the basics of what we're talking about, let's just set the stage. What exactly is patient data archiving? Well, thank you, Brian. I appreciate the opportunity to present today. And, and to everyone on the call, hopefully we'll be able to share some good information and, uh, and make it worth your while. So the question, what is patient data archiving, I think the term patient data archiving, it became a bit of a catch-all phrase for many things, like a lot of things do, but it really boils down to a couple of areas. First and primarily, it's around the long-term storage of protected healthcare information, or PHI. Um, and secondly, it's an avenue to facilitate the retirement of those production computer systems, uh, both the hardware and the software. And there can really be a lot of confusion, excuse me, confusion around the PHI section of it and you know what systems contain PHI, what is PHI, how long do you need to maintain access to the information in the systems, and really what's the best path to getting all this done. Um, keep in mind that there's really no single way to handle this. There's many ways that you can meet the industry data retention regulations and laws. Um, some are more efficient and effective than, you know, than others. And uh, what I'll do today is share what I've found over the years to be the best practices in this area. All right. Well, you talked about the data retention requirements there. Let's get into a little bit more detail there. How long should patient data be kept? Well, this is, the, this is really the million-dollar question, and the answer is really not an easy one, uh, as you would think it would be. Uh, most of the data retention laws um, are state-issued, and um, many are hard, really hard to interpret. I mean, they're very subjective. I know it's kind of hard to imagine a government regulation that uh, is hard to, uh, hard to uh, button down, but that, that tends to be the case in this also. So there's really many, a number of factors involved in determining uh, what the required retention time is. Things like uh, primarily what state do you practice in, what type of practice are you, uh, what type of information is being documented, and how old was your patient, uh, which kind of ties into what, you know, what type of practice are you. Uh, the link at the bottom of this slide, you can see it's the, uh, the healthit.gov link. That, that will take you to a state-by-state -state listing of the retention laws published by healthit.gov. And as Brian said, you'll be receiving a copy of this presentation, so you don't have to try to write down that, that uh, web address right now. You'll get it when, uh, when you get the presentation. Uh, we have an example. This is, I, it's always good to kind of look at one and get a feel for it. Uh, the example on the screen is for the state of Kansas. 
and you can see the law states you must re, uh, maintain those records for 10 years from the date of service with the caveat if the patient's a minor you must keep the record for 10 years or one year past the age of majority so really in essence that would be 19 years if you saw the patient in the first year of their life. So, and again, it changes from state to state, uh, but typically what you're going to find that most organizations look at it as a seven to tier, excuse me, seven to 10 year data retention um, is, you know, what they look at as a minimum. But I will tell you that it's a real, it's a real challenge within almost every organization from the smallest to the largest that I've worked with over the years in really make a making a decision on how long to keep the data. Um, and I think you, you know, and we may touch on it later depending on the questions, but I think you'll find that most people anymore are leaning towards just maintaining the data forever. I, at least, I know forever is a long time, but it's indefinite. Um, you know, uh, at, at this point, because the storage of large quantities of data has became a lot less of a factor than it was, obviously, uh, when it was on paper and then in the early days of, of uh, computer systems. Well, it's interesting you say that because, you know, we do a lot of HIPAA education and people often ask this question. And as you said, it's the million dollar question because it's set by state law. There's really not an easy answer to that. People are looking, you know, they want you to say seven years, and it just varies so much. But, uh, you know, beyond that, I, I have heard a lot of people recommend that you just keep records indefinitely because, like you said, storage costs are essentially nil. But, uh, you know, there must be a downside to keeping them forever as well. Well, yeah, I think, I think the, you know, what you'll hear um, in many instances is that legal counsel will say, there's exposure legally to um, medical records or protected healthcare information um, in a bad sense, or possibly in a bad sense, let's put it that way. They look at it truly from a legal sense, and that at the day we are no longer legally required to maintain those records, let's purge them, right? So the exposure is gone. But it's a challenging thing to do because what do you purge? Do you purge the entire record? So John Smith was you know last data service was 10 years ago and you purge that record um, do you purge by um, you know if John Smith had records five years ago do you try to purge and ones 10 years ago do you try to purge just the ones that were you know 10 years ago so it sounds easy but when you get down to the details of it it becomes much more complex and I'll be honest with you we've done hundreds of archives and we have many organizations that start out with, we're going to purge this data. We're only going to maintain it for seven years or 10 years. Um, and we've been at this over 10 years. We've not had anybody purge yet. Yeah. So no, no one at the organization can agree on what makes sense. So, you know, by default, it's just keep the data. Yeah, you can and see how it would certainly at least be simpler if you just kept it um, in correct. that respect. Well, for those folks who are interested in learning more about rec medical record retention, where are resources for them? Well, uh, so on the on the previous slide was was that uh, the link to that uh, healthit.gov. So that's a good site to go to. I would recommend everybody go there, uh, look at their look at their state, um, get a get a clear understanding of what um, healthit.gov is saying for your state or the record retention laws for it. Um, and note when you when you look at the, when you go to that site and look, you're going to find the actual. They show the actual regulation number. So that Kansas regulation number uh, literally was 100-24-2. And if you Google that identifier, you can drill down to the actual regulation in detail. I mean, it's quite interesting. And then uh, may not be quite interesting for everybody. It is for some people to then read the actual laws that's written. You can glean some more information. So. But there are a number of organizations that can provide you good information on the subject. You can see at the top of this slide there is um, the blog from our organization, uh, which is healthdataarchiver.com uh, slash blog. And uh, that's continually updated. There's multiple updates a month. But uh, we're not the only one out there providing information for that. So 
it's pretty readily available. Um, but like anything else, everybody has their opinion. Um, so, you know, take information for what it is and and um, and absorb it and, and and glean what what you should out of it. So, but no matter where you get the information, I would strongly recommend that everybody that's listening, um, if you don't have one already, spend the time and build out a comprehensive data retention plan. And for many of you, that might be a single page, you know, memo type document. Um, if you have you know, one one system or you know maybe two systems that you know you have retired or need to retire, um, or for a larger hospital health system organization, that can be a, a pretty complex um, legal driven you know set of policies. And some organizations already have them. It's probably a good idea to go back and review them, compare them against those state regulations. Um, and again, even a small practice, you, you may want to engage legal counsel. But um, I think everybody's, everybody's dealing with the, the HIPAA regulations. And Brian, as you said, um, you guys work with it every day. Uh, just the act of having that policy in place and having, um, having the proof that you're working that policy and, uh, and attempting to maintain accordance, in accordance to it has a lot to do if you ever do have those, uh, those uh, an audit from, you know, a HIPAA audit, those types of things. So no matter how you handle it, take it seriously and, and put something in place would be my recommendation. That's a great point because, you know, I think there's probably a lot of ambulatory providers out there who, you know, in the paper universe were just kept their paper and it built up and built up. And now that they're in a digital world, may not have given a lot of thought to what they need to have set for policies around this, but you're right, you know, if it comes to a uh, government uh, audit, God forbid, they want to see documentation around this sort of thing that you've got policies in place around it. So, and, and like you said, you know, one page could be sufficient for a small organization. It's not like it needs to be elaborate, just need to have some thought put into it and get something in place. And, and, if, and you're right, and if anybody has anybody, uh, wants to see examples of it, feel free to reach out. I think my contact will be included. Feel free to reach out. We'll be glad to assist in, in giving you examples of what organizations have put together. But Brian, you bring up a really good point that, that I didn't have down, um, and that is the, um, you know, when the traditional, the traditional record retention has been paper records, right? So it was really easy to visualize. It's a box of charts and you know whether it's stored in the basement or whether it's in a storage unit or whether it's off in you know a controlled environmental storage area like Iron Mountain or such it's really easy to get your head around that physical storage all right I've got records I've stored them away it may be a real pain to get them but if I had to I could go get them the the electronic data to electronic data not that it's a new phenomenon but we're fairly new in this meaning um, most people have not made moves from, you know, multiple moves from one electronic system to another. So the whole, even the whole concept of it's a little bit hard to grasp. And in many instances, it's it's even a second thought. It's like, oh, you're right, you're right. We do have a bunch of information in that system that we have to maintain. What are we going to do with that? So um, we surely are, as an organization, um, at, at my company experiencing I mean that's a good thing for us right I mean we do this for uh, we do this for a living so the um, the transitions from one electronic system to another has really uh, picked up that area of the business so but it's a good point to bring out so when exactly do providers typically go about needing to archive their patient data yeah I would say that I mean in a in a general sense it's transitioning from one system to another right so it's it's driven by a practice or a hospital replacing one system with one with another um, and as we just chatted about you know we're still seeing some situations where some on the on the clinical side where somebody's coming off paper to an electronic health record system and they're looking how to deal with those paper records but most today are electronic data to electronic data situations now you can just to, to add, you know, to to comment further on the paper side, you surely can digitize those paper records. So if you've got a chart room full of charts and you truly 
want to get rid of those charts completely, you can get those scanned and get them in a digital format. I can tell you that that's, that's a major project. Um, so it just has to do with how clean those charts are, how organized they are. Do you want, would you want the electronic um, record, the electronic file to be separated by tabs? Um, could you accept it all as one big document? Um, you know, that might be harder to find the data, but it would be less complex to do. Those can be done, and uh, we work with a number of organizations that do that, and then we can bring that into the archive. Um, but again, I think, you know, as we found, most people have pushed those paper records aside, uh, stored them in some fashion, and, and, you know, again, feel comfortable that they've got um, they've got that record retention met by that, and they do, quite honestly. I mean, as long as you have access to them and they're stored properly, um, there's nothing uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Much harder to retrieve the information going forward, but there's surely nothing wrong with storing it, storing them that way. So, but I think I think you know it's it tends to be a really stressful time when you're moving to from one computer system to another, and you find that most of your focus is around the new go forward system not with how you're going to deal with the old one that's being, that needs to be retired. So again, there's really a tendency to ignore that old system and deal with it later. So if you're in the mode of looking to replace a system, I would, again, recommend that dealing with the old system be part of your plan because you're going to have to deal with it at some point anyway. I mean, it's not going to go away. Um, so think about it in that plan. You're not going to find very many... Um, of the electronic health records or other systems, but typically the EHR vendors bring it up to you because it's they don't. And I mean, I'm not. This is not at all being critical of them, but they why complicate the process of getting you to move on to their system by talking about the old legacy system, right? I mean, it's just a. It's don't bring it up, um, and you know it'll get dealt with at some point. Uh, but we're finding more and more that's just the right time to address it is in that thought process of when you're planning on making the move. So, um, but again, so mainly around system replacement, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, it's, I mean, that's as we all know, that's a you know a significantly active thing going on. So whether you're a practice that's merging together with a group, being acquired by a hospital. Um, whether you're a hospital or health system that's in acquisition mode or merger mode, uh, those tend to just cause massive amount of um, systems in their wake that need to be retired. And it's not uncommon for us to go into a, a health system that has eight or ten hospitals. Uh, they're moving them all over to Epic, um, and there are a variety of different uh, inpatient and, uh, and, and ambulatory systems that are all going to be absorbed over into Epic. So, I mean, we've done we've we've done projects where there's been 50 or more systems out of those hospitals that need to be archived. Now, those projects could take years to get done, um, and but and it's a lot. You know, it's a lot of work, um, but but it just leaves. You know, the the thought of maintaining all of those systems and access to all those systems is next to impossible. So they understand the the nature of that. Uh, practice closure and uh, retirement, relocation, uh, those types of things, those tend to be, those tend to be really overlooked. Um, the, uh, most people don't, e don't even think about that area. I mean, just because you're closing your practice or you're retiring, it doesn't exempt you from the data retention laws. Uh, it's kind of interesting if you go back to that state of Kansas and you actually look up that that law that I, you know, the 10.22, whatever it was, um, I actually wrote down a section here that's clearly spelled out. It says, notice of location of records upon termination of active practice. It says, each licensee of the board who terminates an active practice of the healing arts within this state shall within 30 days after terminating the active practice, provide to the board the following information. A, the location the patient records are stored, and B, if the licensee designates an agent to maintain the records, the name, telephone number, and mailing address of that agent. So kind of interesting. Basically what they're saying is if you're going to close your practice or retire, 
you still are obligated to maintain those records just like you were in business. So we get a lot of people on the tail end that are, well, what am I going to do? And well, I don't want to, you know, I literally am retiring. I don't want to, um, I want to take a server home. I don't want to take right. something home or I don't want to, you know, so what do I do with those? And um, you can facilitate that. Organizations can, can do that. It's what we do. Um, we'll archive those records and make those available securely um, and, and, and do that for, you know, an ongoing uh, uh, annual fee, those types of things. So it, it's surely doable. We're not the only organization out there that does it, but it's something to keep in mind if you are in the, in the golden years of your practice. Well, that's interesting, you know, because people sometimes forget that uh, HIPAA, the security rule, it's not just about confidentiality. It's also about the availability of those records. So you are required by federal law to keep those records available to patients. Yep, absolutely. So here's a great, a giant question, I think. Uh, in the case of system replacement, why not just do a data conversion so you've got all that data in the new system? Yeah, we don't really even have enough time for me to know. <laughs> so this is probably the most common question and the biggest area of confusion that I deal with and have for many, many years. Um, I, I have been in the health IT world for over 25 years now, and I've truly never seen a complete data conversion. It's really a misnomer at best. Uh, most data conversions from one system to another consist of demographics, typically demographics, and then some subset of the remaining information. And that's really dependent upon what you're coming from and going to. So um, they just, there is no standard. And so, you know, many times it's, it's, try, it's trying to fit, you know, vegetables in a, in a fruit basket. It just, you know, they're, they're two separate things. So um, in the early years of system archiving, and that literally was 10 years ago, um, most of the archiving system, most of the systems that we archived were financial systems, and the typical routine was to run down the AR in the old system, and then once it was done, you were in lookup mode only, we would archive it at that point. So that was a pretty straightforward process. Um, but but um, today, we're finding that, you know, it's, you know, while there's still the, the financial systems are being archived, now we're in the clinical world, right? People are going from one EHR to another EHR, um, and that, that just adds a lot more uh, complexity to it. So, you know, that dynamic of clinical information needed to be available at the point of care, um, and it doesn't fit into the new EHR. So, you know, you really had the options of going through the pain and expense of trying to get enough of that clinical information in the go-forward system that would satisfy the docs, you know, the clinical staff. Um, but quite honestly, that's derailed many implementation timelines and budgets. And quite honestly, I've seen a number of times where it literally blew up the entire project, meaning it, it drug on and became so complex and so costly to try to meet the end user stakeholders' needs for the data that they needed to see in that go-forward system that the, the the projects got the, the you know got the plug pulled on them. Um, you know we've jokingly in the industry you know there's a few systems that we say those are um, those are job enders right for <laughs> for the, the 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 IT or you know the CIO or whoever you know whoever that selected that system. So um, the bottom line really is that a data conversion is almost never a viable option for maintaining access to the records in a legacy system. I mean, quite honestly, if it was, everybody would be doing it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, conversions are one thing, but the ability to have that full record to meet the data retention laws. So it's kind of think of it this way. If you, even if you were able to pull over enough meaningful information out of the system you're going to retire into the go forward system that allowed you to continue seeing the patient, answering questions, you know, meeting their clinical needs, um, whatever it is. You still, I, again, I've never seen it. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I mean, anything could happen with enough work. You're still not. You still don't have a full 
uh, legal record which is contained in that legacy system. So when you get that subpoena for records or that patient inquiry, whatever it be, the ability to go back and have it fully constructed of what occurred in that at that time in that source system is important. Very, very hard to do bringing it over into the source system. So hopefully well, you know, that I think, answers it. I think there's this kind of uh, mistaken belief out there among some folks that they should just be able to sort of hook up the databases to each other and everything will just flow into the new system. But it just, as you're saying, it just really couldn't be further from the truth. And obviously, you know, the more data you're trying to move over, the more complex and more expensive it's going to be. Well, I tell you, I mean, we do this for a living um, and we have been for a long time. And when we started doing our first archives 10 or 12 years ago, we um, really thought, okay, within three or four years, we will have built data extraction and transformation routines to where this really becomes cookie cutter, right? So somebody's going to archive mm, all scripts, next gen, e-clinical works, Meditech, wh whatever it is, whether it's a, you know a, a, an ambulatory system or an inpatient system, and really we would just connect up and flip the switch and it would chew the data up and bring it over and archive it. Um, that was a fantasy. I mean, every yeah. system, they're all, they're all customized, they're all used differently. People say, well, you know, I'm really not, I'm going to use that doctor uh, auxiliary field. I'm not really going to use it for that. I'm going to store this in it. Uh, um, so every system is different. Uh, even systems that we've archived 30, 40, 50 times with the same system. Granted, we're much more efficient at doing it, you know, every time we do it, but it's still a muscle job every time we do them. And again, this is what we do for a living. So yeah, it's a, it's a misnomer. So how then, if people are going about archiving the patient data, how is that archive data usually displayed? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, we have a few examples of how data can be displayed and presented back to you, I think the next two or three screens. Um, and now there's a couple approaches to this. One is to present the data back to you in the way that as closely as possible resembles the system that you're archiving. So you're coming off of you're coming off of all scripts and you're moving over to Cerner, or you're coming off of all scripts, you know, moving over to to eClinic, whatever it is. Um, you know, you'll 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 get the school of thought of well, I want my I want my archive data to look as much like the system I'm coming off of in that example, all scripts as possible, and it can be customized to do that. I mean, I think most organizations that archive have the ability to uh, to be flexible in the way they're presenting it back to you, but I would I would recommend to be careful in that thought process because the way that it looks in the system you're coming off of is not as important as you think it is. Um, trust me, a couple of years, well, sometimes even months, but, you know, within a year and a half, two years, you more than likely won't even remember what that old system looked like. You're so engrossed in the go forward, and many times, you know, you end up with no staff that even remembers the old system. So we typically, we, we, we deploy uh, master templates uh, of recommended views, and then we customize from there. We find that most people want as generic a look as possible, and it may not. In, and also, if you ever archive multiple sources, you know, God forbid you have to archive. You know, if you're a practice, God forbid that you're going to ever leave the one you're moving to or have just moved to, and move to another one. But trust me, it happens all the time. We can archive. We archive multiple sources of data in the same archive. You want those to be as common as possible because you don't want to have to train people to go retrieve and access that data. So if you look at the example on the screen, that's a, that's a patient screen, a patient financial data screen. Uh, up at the top, you can see the demographics. Those will be standard across you know, all, all the different uh, uh, tabs or screens you're looking at. And if you look over on the left-hand side, what's highlighted is financial history. That's just showing you an example of breaking down the detail of that financial history. So, um, and those tabs on the left are dynamic based on what you archive. I mean, if you're archiving 
uh, a billing system only. You're not going to have meds and you know vaccinations and vitals in there. It may be it may be um, appointments and insurance and um, you know uh, office notes and financial history and documents, but it wouldn't have any of the clinical. If it was a clinical only system, it would may not have any financials or appointments in it, and vice versa. Or if it's an integrated uh, billing and, and clinical system, it might have all of them. So it really just depends. Um, and then the real estate, you're obviously limited by the real estate that you have on the screen, but you can then uh, you can nest screens together. So if you need the real estate, you you know you're able to click on a uh, a particular uh, record uh, even in that detail area and drill down deeper if needed. So that's interesting. You know, I I can't think of anything that would be more frustrating than having to train people on a system that no longer exists. So <laughs> obviously, readability is important. Here's another screen I see. Uh, what can you tell us about this one? Yeah, that's that's an example. That's an example of moving up and seeing um, how how you might display. Uh, uh, meds that were, were presented to somebody. So, again, don't don't drill in and look and go. Well, wait a minute. Our system doesn't have something called generic name or the you know the start date of something. Those are all just labels. So, data. Our folks. It's almost it's almost comical in in some aspects. Um, and when you when you talk to the data folks that do this work, at least in our organization. They don't even care. I mean, data to them is data. So, you know, they look at the labels and how does it need to be broken out and what tables is it in. So it's really just a matter of what's in that source system and how do you want it displayed and presented back to you. So this is, again, you see at the top there's demographic information that moved from screen to screen, and then there, that's an example of how you might present back uh, meds out of a system. And then what about this screen? So this one's a little harder to, to discern, but if you look over on the right where you see that physician hospital discharge summary, imagine that's a, a PDF that popped up when you clicked on it. So one of the things, um, what, an important thing to keep in mind when you're going to archive is look, find, I'm, again, I'm tr I try. I want to make sure that I say this right because I'm not being critical. We did many projects early days where everything was we would take everything out of the source system and create a PDF document. And that PDF might have been 30 pages, 50 pages, 100 pages long, and there was one per patient. You looked it up. It literally was a, you know, it, it was a inexpensive way of accessing those patient records, um, and it was all in a single PDF. The again meets the need, but you don't have the discrete data or the pieces of data coming out of the database. So if you ever have to go back and do data mining on that, on that system, you retired, you're unable to do it. But every, almost every system has both what's called discrete data and it has blobs of data or you know, scanned documents, scanned images, system generated documents, transcription documents, those types of things that literally are a document. Um, it make it, in this example, it's a PDF. So this was a probably a either a you know came in from an interface and it was in the EHR or it was a system generated document. In this instance, you selected the the metadata was out there that allowed you to select it. So it said it was for you know for uh, Janet Morris and it was you know the physician hospital summary discharge on such a date. That's what you wanted. You clicked on it. It literally launched a PDF. Uh, to present back to you, so so I would I would one of the things I'd point out in this in this area of the discussion is I would recommend that whatever you do, if possible, uh, select a system that brings all the discrete data over as discrete data, and all the blobs of data or all the the scanned documents, transcription, those types of things get brought over in that way, um, and that, again, so that you have the ability to data mine. The discrete data in that database, and right now there may you may not even see a lot of, of need for that. There's times where in the financial side docs were paid, um, you know, based on certain things. You have to go back and run those reports. If the old system's gone, uh, you want to have the ability to go back and do that, right? So, um, and last but not least, you should have you really should have the ability to easily print to a file or to a printer 
part or all of the of the record coming out of uh, out of your archive. So that's where you're going to find the majority of your uh, requests are going to come in as um, you know a, a record release. I need this for whether it's a patient inquiry or uh, a legal inquiry, those types of things. So the ability to get it out of that system very very easily. Um, in my opinion, is a very important thing. So, so then let's say that uh, you know someone's done this step of archiving their patient data in a digital way. You know, where is that data? Where does it actually live then? Yeah, that's that's an overlooked question. Also, now the trend over the past few years has been to utilize a utilize a vendor that can securely store it and make it make that archive data in the cloud. And that's an overused term, and <laughs> you hear that all the time. It's cloud-based. What that really means is that it resides uh, outside of your four walls or outside of your office, but it's secure uh, both where it's at and it's secure and compliant access to that. So your, your path back and forth to, to access and view that data is encrypted so it meets HIPAA requirements. But you're really seeing that trend now where Five years ago, it was probably 70% of every archive we deployed was on the customer site, and it's pretty much flipped. It's probably 60% now are being deployed in the cloud. People are becoming more comfortable with it, and they're really looking and saying, "Why would I? Why would I want to have another system?" I mean, this is it is what it is, right? It's look up legacy data. Um, you, you may not be in it a lot, especially a couple of years, you still got to have access to it, right? But it isn't like you're in it seven hours a day. Um, and um, so, but either way can be done. Um, if you're going to deploy it in the cloud, I would make sure that the vendor can um, can convince, you know, can prove to you that everything is HIPAA compliant. Um, look at the, the place that they're storing it at. We, we, we only work in a tier three data centers, offsite, those types of things. And, and quite honestly, even internally within our organization, I mean, we're a data, we're an IT tech firm. We have almost nothing, and I'm not talking about our customer-based stuff. We have almost nothing within our own organization stored uh, inside anymore. It's all in the cloud at a data center because they are, they are fully, you know, you can't get in that thing without, without giving, you know, your, your fingerprint and um, leaving your keys in the tray and getting a badge and you know, there is uh, 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 gas-powered redundant generators and multiple paths in from, I mean, it's just, you know, it's mind-boggling what goes into these Tier 3 and Tier 4 data centers. So, I mean, we're actually, as an organization, completely non-dependent upon our own office. If, if a tornado hit our office here, we could, uh, we could be up and working the next day in another location because we have no systems within our own organization. So I'm only telling you that. So I mean, that's how much we trust it, and you're finding more and more people in the healthcare space are saying the same thing. But if you need to keep the data um, that's archived within your own technical infrastructure, and just ensure what's being deployed is easily maintained and doesn't require some, you know, wildly unique technical expertise to maintain it. Last thing you want to do is retire one or more systems um, and then have you know, to have to have special expertise to maintain the archive. So, well, so again, again, more, more and more people going to the cloud. But either way, either way is a viable option. Just really depends on your internal and technical expertise and your infrastructure. Well, we've we've also certainly seen that same move to the cloud that you're describing, and it's for similar reasons. For those, uh, you know. Uh, there's the convenience of it and all of that, but there's also the HIPAA disaster recovery requirements and all of that. And if you're in the cloud, it's just so much easier to satisfy those requirements. But also, you also get some economies of scale there in the sense that, you know, if you're uh, with a with some kind of cloud service like this, because you're obviously not their only client, they have a level of technical expertise that you would never be able to have in-house in terms of protecting that data. Yeah, you're at, you're absolutely correct, and and um, the what we found in the early days with was it was it was pretty easy for the smaller uh, practices to make that decision because of just just that they were they're like hey 
<laughs> we trust it, put it out there, it's easy to access, we don't have to worry about it. We saw you know, most large organizations, hospitals and health systems say, no, this needs to be within our own four walls. Um, and, and now we're seeing even, I would say, yeah, it's probably the same percentage. I mean, it's probably 60, 70 percent of even the largest of health health systems and hospitals are are going that route and going. You know what? Just you know, we don't want we don't want the we don't we don't want or need to have this within our own infrastructure. So so it is it is interesting. I tell you what, I think quite honestly, uh, being a little bit of an IT you know person myself, I think five, six, seven years from now. Uh, we'll all look back and, and, you know, when somebody says, well, where do you want this, you would almost shake your head and go, well, why would I, why would I deploy right. it internally? I, I think we're going to find that with even things like desktop applications, like yeah. Microsoft Word, you know, you're seeing folks go to Office 360 and those types of things. And um, Yeah, I've heard, I've heard this from a lot of IT experts that really they think, you know, everything is going to be in the cloud and, uh, or almost everything in, in another few years. And, you know, from, the practices perspective too, you know, if if you're sufficiently cloud-based, it starts to get you to a place where you don't need to have a server in your facility and, and things like that that can also um, be an advantage. Agreed. Yep. So then when it comes to accessibility, you know, it, what kind of devices can actually get into that archive then? Well, you're really finding, you're really finding the folks are requiring more options um, in this area today. In the early days of archiving, when the majority of the archives were financial systems, access from a stationary PC was enough. Uh, today, it, with the advent of needing access at point of care of archived clinical information, the ability to access that through a tablet or other mobile devices is becoming more important. So um, other things to consider is whether you have to install software on your PC or, or tablet to access the archive. So, I would uh, I would recommend looking for a solution that allows you to access the archive the, the, the archive data through a web browser. This way, you don't have to worry about installing software if you purchase a new device. So it's just it's all you know. You open up Internet Explorer or, or or Chrome or Firefox or you know whatever your web browser of choice is. And you know if it's on a if it's on a uh, you know an iPad, it's it's a Safari, etc. Have the ability to access it that way, so you're not literally having to install software on those devices. You know, think of it three years from now, and you get a new PC. I mean, most of us are changing PCs, you know, every two or three years anymore. You just, you know, you don't have to worry about wait a minute, where was that distribution media? I have to now install this client software. So, um, but I would look for something that had uh, that was responsive to mobile devices, and I would look for something that didn't require client-side software on it. That makes a lot of sense. So here is what to me seems kind of like a silly question, but I, you know, I'm sure people are tempted to do this sometimes. So let's, uh, you know, let's definitely address this. Why not just keep the old application living forever and then just, you know, run over to it and grab the data that you need when you need it? Yeah, I think, you, I, I think that it's it's the default. Right, because yeah. you, you know you're com you, you know you're coming off of such and such you know system A. You're moving over to system B. You still you know system A was probably upgraded the hardware and such in the last four or five years. It um, ever you know there's still a core group of people that remember that old system. So it sounds like the logical thing, or the it surely is the easiest thing to do initially. And it really, I mean, it can be a strategy. So, you know, keeping that old system up and running, it's, it's always an alternative to archiving the data that's in it. But it, it really is more problematic than it seems on the surface. So, you know, many, if not most of the time, the old system is not going to make it through the, the data retention life cycle, uh, you know, that 7 to 20 years or, or longer um, without needing new hardware or operating system upgrades or patches due to security risks. I mean, if, if anybody from the IT side of the business, you'll know that, you know, Windows Server 2003 is being sunsetted because of security issues and not applying patches. So you've got IT departments scurrying all over trying to re figure out how to replace any application they have that's running on it. Many of those applications, they haven't been 
There is no upgrade path, so you can't deploy them on an operating system newer. So, you know, you have a system hardware failure. Uh, can you even do it? In many cases, the answer is no. I mean, we've archived many systems to where there was just no upgrade path for it at all. So again, it sounds good, um, and it may, it may get you through a, a period of time, but it's not a solid uh, it's not a solid way to get it done. Um, you can take the approach of keeping a maintenance agreement on the software and hardware for the old system, and then the vendor that you've got the agreement with has the pressure to maintain the system for you. Uh, even then, what you're finding is many of those so those vendors are saying, well, we'll do that for the next three years or such, but they'll even back out of it at a certain point because they're in the same mode. If they have a failure, they can't, uh, they can't bring you back. They can't meet their contractual obligations. And they, even if they could, the costs over those seven to, you know, let's just say seven to 20 years almost always significantly exceeds what it would cost to archive it. So, um, and there's another factor here that's almost always overlooked, and I, I touched on it earlier. While it's hard to imagine when you're coming off of a system that you've been on for years and years, um, the reality is that it's common that the human expertise to access that old system and get any meaningful data out of it is lost after a short period of time. So you may have an old system that's up and functional, but when it comes time to get in and get the data that you need to meet that, whatever the, the record request is, um, you have a whole other battle to fight, whether it's logins and passwords or, again, just somebody that even remembers how to get into that system and actually get that data out. It may be there's seven areas you have to go out, go to and you have to print this and report on that. Um, just trust me, it's a, it can be a it can be a, a whole nother problem on itself. So, And again, then you're faced with the kind of frustration of training people on a system that no longer is useful except for accessing the archive. It seems like such a waste. And then I'd also just like to add, you know, the thing that you mentioned before, people as they're moving to a new system, it may be hard for them to imagine. But what happens then if you move systems again? You know, your, your practice gets purchased or whatever. You know, when, what happens when you've got two or three old systems? Obviously, that becomes very unwieldy. I was talking to a, talking to a gentleman yesterday that um, they've been, they're a, um, a specialty group that's led buying up practices across the country and um, very unique in their model, but they, uh, I think there are about 30 acquisitions in so he you know this and this gentleman is in IT I think he's got 27 different systems now that he's keeping alive oh, um, he's brand amazing. you know every everybody they acquire is going on to their go forward system and he literally is just I mean it's almost insanity so even maintaining pass logins and passwords let alone getting in and it's all upon it's all up in that instance it's all upon IT I mean so the inquiry comes in the record uh, pull in, you know, uh, request comes to IT, and IT has to uh, find the system, find the login, find the password, and hopefully find, have the skill set or find the resource to be able to get the data out of it. So, while that's an extreme example of it, uh, even one or two systems within a practice, again, we've archived. I don't know. I saying hundreds would probably be exaggerating. We 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 archive scores of systems to where it was a single system. Um, they hadn't got into it in six months. They went to get into it, and they couldn't even get the data out of it. They didn't even know how to get the data out of it, so they just said archive it for us. So yeah. just think about it. It's hard. Again, it's hard when you're just coming off of or getting ready to come off of a system because it's been your life for many, many years. But uh, trust me, if you, it's the old, if you don't use it, you lose it. It happens really fast. So let's get down to brass tacks then. How long does patient data archiving typically take, and what is a cost expectation? So the length of time to archive an old system really can vary a lot. Um, it's not uncommon to see, you know, an ambulatory system, whether that's a, you know just a billing or an EHR or a combo, 60 to 90 days. Um, a lot of that's just dependent upon access to the system when you're ready to go into lookup only. The actual work of getting it done sometimes is a, you know, it might be a, a two, three, four week, 
process to get it all completely done and get it deployed back out to you, whether that's in the cloud or on your on your premise. Um, but you know, the, a lot of times there's a lot of prep work. It's getting the data out, getting connectivity, and all those types of things. Um, in the case of large inpatient systems, it's not uncommon for the process to take 12, 18 months. A lot of times they're done in phases. Uh, we'll do clinical data immediately, uh, come back in phase two. We might move in and do uh, HR and payroll, um, you know, or others, um, and then do uh, clinical data out of the system, and then while they're running down AR, and then come back 12 months later and do the finance, you know, do another poll and do the financial system. So um, now, if you are in a situation to where there's a hard timeline, whether that's we want, we need to get out from under that maintenance contract, and that can be that in many cases that's a timeline driver, um, or we're going to lose access to the data somehow, um, whether that's I'm leaving a group, uh, um, I'm you know leaving a cloud-based solution that you know I got to get the data out of. Many times, even if it can't be archived, if, as long as you get a snapshot of the data, and that's we do that on a regular basis, we'll go in and get a you know what we need to archive it. Um, but you may not ar physically archive the data for another 30 or 45 days. So there's some ways. If you're in a situation to where it's an emergency, we got to get you know we got two weeks to get you know to get that data. We're not going to have access to it. Many times you can get a copy of the data itself and then do the actual you know extraction and transformation out of that snap of data um, at a later date. So. Um, the cost can also range significantly depending on the system, um, how long it was used, the amount and types of data in the system, how much it was customized, what modules you used. And there's just a there's a laundry list of items that you know make it that have the the ability to um, affect the level of effort that it takes to go ahead and do the archive. A general rule of thumb is that you should be able to get a system archived for the equivalent of 18 to 24 months of the maintenance cost you have currently have or you had some people may have already dropped off maintenance we call that you know just going bare going naked it's you know they're they've left moved on to another system they've canceled their support and maintenance on the old system and for the sake of better terms you're crossing your fingers and hoping that nothing happens right it happens on a regular basis that we see that um, but think of it as about 18 to 24 months of whatever your maintenance costs are or were is typically uh, a rule of thumb of what an archiving sh or an archive solution should fall into. And then there's different ways to uh, contract. Some of them are I want to I want to own it. And I'm, I'm careful in saying that. I'm not talking about owning the data. The data should always be yours no matter who you're doing it with. It's an important piece when, you, when you're get, entering into a contract is to understand ownership of the data itself. Um, but then there's, you know, there's the ability to do it in a, I'm going to get a license agreement and I'm going to pay for the labor costs. I'm going to, you know, it's a one-time cost. There might be a small maintenance uh, fee to maintain it. Or you can do infrastructure as a service is another buzzword. So instead of you know, paying a lot more money up front, it's spread out over a long period of time. You might sign a seven-year contract, spend X amount of dollars up front, and then have a, a seven-year contract renewable after that, you know, the X amount of dollars a month. So there's there's a number of ways that you can, that organizations will work with you on that. So then when it comes to stages here, I think we've got some uh, animations that sort of go through some of what is involved here. Yeah, and that's just a normal. What, what I mean, from our standpoint, what we recommend, um, and, and the way that we handle projects, we always kick off, lay the foundation. There's an analyzation process, uh, you know, analyzing the data. Uh, that's typically where we have to engage your team, meaning the, the 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 organization that's archiving, and that's looking at that source system, understanding how you used it, what modules you used. Um, how you want the data labeled, we'll walk through those generic screen layouts and make sure that you're good with um, what's going to be presented back to you. Then we leave and basically go to work and we do all the data extracts and we do the transformation of the data, build it out 
based on that analyzed um, um, uh, portion of the project. Then we present that back to you um, for validation and approval. And um, it's not uncommon to have changes. And it's like, wait a minute, I'd really like to see this over here or this over there. But there, but the the involvement um, is again, most places are they're they're looking at their go forward. They don't want to spend a lot of time on you know looking back. So we try to minimize the amount of the, of the customer's involvement as possible. But there, it's always going to require some. And once once the validation is done. Um, then it's then it's deployed again, whether it's deployed in the cloud or deployed on site. All right. Well, we have some time. We're kind of running short on time, but we've got some great questions that I want to get to. So let's go ahead and get okay. to some of those in the time that's remaining. And I'll just read the first one here to you, Rick. Uh, this one is about ICD-10. What will these will the specificity found within ICD-10 ICD-10 Increase the length of time a claim is required to be retained. Now we've seen absolutely no change in the data retention uh, laws uh, based on ICD-10. It's just it's just different data and a different string of data. So no, there is uh, there is uh, no changes in the data retention laws that we've heard of at all. So there's one area of ICD-10 that you don't have to worry about. <laughs> I know right. people are getting nervous now, but uh... all right, let's go to the next question then. What if the record was scanned from front to back in a new system and placed in section old chart file? I don't really understand that, but probably you do, I hope. Well, I, th I think my, my, the way I would interpret that question is, so I've, I've taken chart information out of the legacy system, I've scanned it, I've dropped it into a bucket somewhere on the new system, and I have access to it. That's a pretty common thing to do. Uh, it kind of goes back to the discussion earlier, and that is almost never is that going to be the entire record. So you know, it may have been a print chart function or something out of the old system, but that's typically only going to take a piece or a subset of the record. It surely can help you in point of care in the new in the go forward system to have a subset of records, but it's not going to meet the requirement to maintain you know the full record from that legacy system. All right, let's go to our next question then. Um, how would you handle other systems we would need to archive, like our hospital, HR, and payroll systems? Ah, that's a good question. Um, that is one of the things, one of the things that, um, and I touched on it a little earlier, but important if you are um, an organization that has that requirement, meaning there's going to be something other than what uh, we call patient-centric data, meaning when I go to search, I'm going to search on a patient's last name, first name, date of birth, SOCH, uh, you know, uh, medical record ID, whatever that be, um, that you have the ability to have what are called, what we call different data domains, whether that's so anything that's not patient-centric, it might be HR data, it might be payroll data, it might be general ledger data, systems that you would be retiring because they were being replaced by, you know, Epic or Cerner or something else, right? So um, and uh, so it's important to do that and have the that your archive has the ability to do that if you now or foresee having that need in the future. And that's again not here at all to talk about our product, but we have the ability to have multiple data domains and those, you know, it, so you can search by, you know, an inventory ID for an inventory system or you can search by, you know, something else for an HR record, those types of things. So it's all doable. Do We've done many of those. Well, this is somewhat related and I think this is a really interesting question. I think we got time for one more here before we wrap up. This question is, if you archive more than one system, can you restrict someone from accessing one of the systems? It's a good question. Um, it, it happens a lot um, when we archive multiple systems. I mean, you might, whether it's whether it's you know this very sensitive data, it might be that it's psych data, that type of thing, and it's very very sensitive. Um, and so, look for a system that has, um, you know, it has access mapping. So in that case. You know, I've got five systems I've archived, and I want to give, you know, 
gym access to three of those because for whatever reason it might be that's the only one Jim ever needs so don't don't uh, confuse his world with anything else or that it's so sensitive that only legal might have access to a specific source of data so so yeah that's important um, and it's definitely something to look for um, in a solution that you would select if, you know if you're going to have multiple sources of data well, Rick, I really want to thank you for joining us uh, today. This has been very informative, and I know there's so many people out there who are facing this situation who really, you know, this has got to be extremely valuable information for them for what their options are. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk to you folks. Now, for anyone who would like more information about uh the services offered by Health Data Archiver, please do go to www.healthdataarchiver.com. You can see the URL on your screen there. And then, as I said before, we're going to send the slides and the uh, video recording of this session after the event's concluded, and you'll be able to just click on the link right there if you're interested in learning more about how they may be able to help you if you're facing this sort of situation yourself. If you need training in Meaningful Use PQRS or HIPAA, compliance. Remember that you can always stop by our website and if you click in, uh, or rather if you type in www.formedtraining.com, it'll take you right to the curriculum page where you can get that training. If you go to our homepage at formedapproved.com and click on content, you can also see our free resources. We have blogs and various guides that can help people that are all free. And our learning lunch series is always free as well. Right on our homepage, if you look at the learning lunch button. You can click on that. It'll take you and show both our free learning lunches and then we also do workshop series that are coming up so you can see what's available there and register for upcoming events. So keep your eyes peeled for future events and for the follow-up to this one. Rick, I'd just like to thank you one more time for joining us. It was a great learning lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. See you next time.